everyone to the uh, second lecture of the Medieval University and the Question of Education seminar series. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is uh, Dr. Holly Hamilton Bleakley, and I'm the director of the Medieval and Renaissance Studies program here at USD. And so I'm, I'm the coordinator for this seminar series. Um, as I mentioned, this is like this is the, the second installment, so we're very excited for this series, and um, we have hopes that it's going to generate important conversations and reflections on the purpose of our uh, higher education system, also how those purposes are carried out. Um, and we hope it will also generate interest in the medieval and Renaissance period and show the immense richness of this period for helping us gain important insights into our own time and place. And so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker for the series, uh, Professor Stephen Farolo. Um, Professor Farolo served as Dean uh, for the USD School of Law from 2011 to, two, uh, to 2020. From 1979 to 1987, he taught history as an assistant professor at Stanford. His publications include The Origins of the University, The Schools of Paris and Their Critics. Uh, he graduated magna cum laude from, uh, with high honors from Wesleyan University and was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University. He earned his PhD in history at Princeton and his JD at Stanford, where he graduated with honors. He is a member of the Order of the Coif. In 2006, Biocom awarded him with the William W. Otterson Service Award, presented for outstanding support of the life sciences industry in San Diego. In 2011, the Daily Journal listed him as one of the top 25 biotech lawyers in California. He was also selected for inclusion in the corporate law, leverage buyouts, and private equity law and venture capital law categories of the best lawyers in San Diego. He's listed in Chambers USA, America's leading lawyers for business in the life sciences category and in the biotechnology law category of the best lawyers in America. In October 2014, the Law Library Justice Foundation honored him with the 2014 Bernard E. Whitkin Award for Excellence in Teaching of the Law, and he was a recipient of the Convivio Communitas Award for Leadership in May 2017. Uh, the title of his talk is Foundations of the University, Paris Masters and Scholars in the 12th and 13th Centuries. Please give a little welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So the interesting question from all of that is, is how does someone who was a medieval historian <laughs> become a biotech lawyer? But we can we can talk about that later. And 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 I think that you know it, it's a point that was made by um, uh, Professor Evans last week, it, and it's always been this concept. I mean, it really dates back to the 12th century in the university. Is the role of the university is to prepare people for careers, and by careers I don't mean jobs. I mean careers. Because careers take interesting twists. A computer scientist gets a PhD in medieval history. A medieval historian becomes a biotechnology lawyer. Those are careers, not jobs. Okay, and, and I think you would agree with me, Professor Evans, that it's the university gave us that gift of preparing that for that life. I'm a first generation college student. I have five university degrees. My parents did not graduate from high school. And we see many of the people back in the 12th century, I'll refer to a couple of them, who made the university were people who came from very humble backgrounds. Universities became an avenue for people to advance socially, just as they have remained, just as they remain that way. Professor Evans also talked last week about the issue of competing elites. And sort of one of the themes and the story that I'm gonna tell is about competing elites, okay? So anyway, I got a lot to talk about. We'll see if we can get through it. I'm gonna take my jacket off, is that okay? Is good. Okay. So, uh, universities have not always existed. Universities as we know them came into existence in 12th century Europe. The university has its origins, in its origins, sorry, is a medieval institution. And the fundamental characteristics of the first universities, those at Bologna, Paris, and, and Oxford, each of which was formed before the end of the 12th century, endures, those, those characteristics endure in the universities of the 21st century. Three characteristics distinguish this new institution that came into existence in the 12th century from other institutions of learning. First of all, the university was and is an autonomous and enduring corporate body. 
a formal association with a significant degree of legal autonomy and rights and privileges of self-governance. University exercised control over its membership and could make and enforce its own statutes. In its legal form, the university was originally just like other guilds or professional associations, a, communi a, commun a communia or a societas, just like goldsmiths or tanners. It was a community of professionals engaged in study, a studium, a particular term for what we, was a studium, okay? The term universitas was originally applied to any guilds or institutions. There were, university, un, there were universities of goldsmiths or tanners, but by the end of the Middle Ages, the university came specifically and exclusively applied to these educational institutions, institutions of higher learning. In the 12th century, certain studia, okay, most notably those in Paris and Bologna, grew in their reputations and attracted masters and students, not just in the local region or diocese, but from a wider geographical area. These became known as studium generale, studium generale, in contrast to studia locale, and the studium generale, studia generale, are what grew into universities. The second characteristic of this new institution was its emphasis on sharing the sharing and transmission of knowledge. The common endeavor of the members of the community or guild of the university was not so much independent study and research or contemplation as it was in the monastic schools, but learning and teaching, the expansion of, the expansion of knowledge or the expansion, the expansion of the availability of knowledge, the expansion, the expansion of education. The professional identity of this community or guild consisted of teaching and being taught, as is evidence in the first university statutes, which we'll be looking at a little bit later and I gave you copies of. Third, in contrast to other schools, Studio Generale were not narrowly specialized in one academic discipline. By the 13th century, a studium generale was defined to subsume the specialization of academic disciplines and the division of faculties within a broader institutional structure defined by common educational goals and purposes. To be a studium generale, teaching was required in at least one of the higher disciplines of theology, canon or civil law or medicine, as well as in the liberal arts. This is the essential concept of the university that we have today. And I went to a college, that, a liberal arts college, it was really a college, it's called university, but we still do have this distinction between colleges and universities. So how and why did this type of educational institution come into being? Over 30 years ago, I wrote this, this, this reference, a book called The Origins of the University, The Schools of Paris and Their Critics. It covered the period from 1100 to 1215. In that book, I argued that Paris should be considered to be the first and the prototypical university, because it was at Paris, the masters and scholars of various disciplines, arts, theology, law, and medicine, all joined together to form a single guild, a single university, the University of Masters and Scholars in Paris. This in contrast to Bologna, which has the, the other claim to be the first university, because what was Bologna? Bologna was the first recognized legal university. It's got its privileges from the emperor Frederick I in the 1150s, but it was a university of law students. The guild was the, was the students journey together to advance their rights in relationship to the law teachers, actually. It's really interesting. And the university evolved out of that. In Paris, what came together at the end of the 12th century, Okay, at, at the very, what happened in Paris in the 12th century is that scholars, teachers, and students in all of the disciplines came together to form a single university. Despite the rivalries and competitiveness among them, okay, and, and the rivalries and competitiveness among faculties was prevalent, prevalent in the 12th century as they are now, if not, if not more so, they joined together to form a single guild. Why and how did that happen? It, um, in my book, I, I challenge the traditional view of why and how this happened. 
taking on what had been an enduring historical interpretation of the origin of the university that dated back to a book published in the late 19th century by an eminent English scholar called Hastings Rashdell. According to Hastings, Hastings Rashdell, and this is very typical of the late 19th century, so much of historiography, the late 19th century, okay, is, 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 this, is this, you know, this freedom and liberty and all this kind of stuff. According to Hastell, the university was shaped by the struggle of scholars to gain freedom and autonomy from external domination and control, especially from the church, ecclesiastical authorities, but also from kings and local civil authorities. That was the view. It was a struggle for academic freedom, you know, from oppression, the oppression of the church and monarchy. What a great 19th century view. Boldly, and at that point I was this, I, this was in the 1980s. I was a much younger person and a pretty bold scholar. I took on this interpretation. And you know, one of the things that one of the reasons why I probably ended up in law school is because I called it a myth. Okay, and you could read. I was going to read the, the paragraph of my book, which sometimes I wish I hadn't written, but I really am glad. But I'm really glad that I did because it's right. It was a myth, just like so much of the way in which we mythologize the past in history. Okay, and I set out my book to disprove it, or at least to attempt to argue that if we look at all the sources and at the time, that we can take another view of the university, that it evolved in, in a different way. Okay, that it evolved out of certain ideals. And, and certain common interests. Now, one of the things is I, you know, I then went to law school. Um, it's very interesting. I wrote a book about the rivalry of faculties uh, called Quid Dant, Ante, Quid Dant Artes Nisi Luctum, which is why study the liberal arts? Because it's the lawyers and the doctors that make all the money, right? <laughs> um, at that point, I was a student at Stanford Law School. So there's a great, I, that article, it's, it's a great irony in it. But anyway, I, did, I haven't spent much time looking at this until I stepped down as dean and started reading again. And one of the things that really annoyed me, okay, was that even though my book was well-received and read the reviews, that some of the more recent histories of universities, I was supposed to write one for Cambridge and someone else did, this guy called Peterson, um, he doesn't agree with me, okay? Um, and his book, The First University, which is written in 1997, which is the year I became a partner at a law firm, this is what he wrote. He wrote, in the first century of, the, of, of their life, universities had to fight on many fronts in order to ensure their existence and as much independence as they could achieve. Bishops and chancellors, town government and king and emperor and pope all wished to have their fingers in the pie. And this is a chapter of the book called The Battle for the universities. I mean, what a, again, how, how does this vestige of this 19th century argument really annoyed me? Okay. Um, but I, you know, as I've sort of looked back at what I wrote and I've looked, spent more time in the period beyond uh, 1215, I'm convinced as ever that I was right. Um, now, as I said, my book only goes as far as 1215 uh, and up to the statutes, which we'll be looking at a little bit later. But as I looked, as I begun to sort of think about maybe writing a broader book and looked into the 13th century, I think that my thesis holds. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what I set forth in my book, and then I'm going to talk about two episodes, two episodes in the, uh, in the, in the 13th century and tell you my interpretation. These are really key events in showing how this university, which formed in the late 12th century, secured its existence in the 13th century um, in, in a very interesting way. Okay. Um, so uh, let's let's start back. So my book begins, my book begins in 1100 when the Paris schools uh, uh, that were the predecessor to the university, most notably the school that was at the Cathedral of Notre Dame on the Ile de la Cité, and then the abbeys of Saint Victor, uh, a great school there. I have a chapter in my book about that school and, and at the School of saint jean on the left bank. Um, uh, and by the way, everybody knows why the left bank is called the Latin Quarter, because what was the common language in education? It was Latin. Okay, so just, just remember that in case you don't know that. It's when those schools achieve preeminence over other schools in the city, in other schools in other cities uh, in France. Okay. And um, but the real focus of my work is on the period from 1150 to 1215 when the university was formed, okay? Now, this was a period that people didn't spend a lot of time on because 
what's interesting about this period from 1150 to 1215, there weren't a lot of conflicts and battles. But this is when the university was formed. But the view of what happened is shaped by what happened before then and what happened after then. So it's sort of interpret, it's, it's, it's interpreted to, to go over into this period. And that's what I try to argue, that basically you got to look at the context of when it's formed. But let's go back. And so basically, much of the story of, you know, the university uh, is this is this struggle, struggle, these battles really um, rest on, and, and we, this was alluded to last week by Professor Evans, by a great battle that took place, battle, conflict that took place in the early 12th century between the great theologian Peter Abelard and the monk Bernard of Clairvaux, okay? Uh, Peter Abelard, as some of you may know, he's known, famous for, you know, the wonderful relationship he had with Eloise and these wonderful letters, which I continue to believe are really letters between Abelard and uh, but no one will ever know for certain. Maybe, have you done a, have you done a, an analysis of them? Maybe that, it's, people have attempted I, that kind of analysis. And it's not really work. So most of us remain, convinced. but anyway, so what happens is, is that Bernard the monk takes on Abelard. Uh, Abelard is ultimately, you know, has to cease teaching, okay? And he's, a great, he's a great theologian. He's confined to a monastery at Cluny in 1141. He dies in 1142, having his theological works, having been declared heretical by Pope, by Pope Innocent II, and they're, they're banned and they're destroyed. Now, I will tell you that Abelard continues to be of great influence. Even the even even in in, in 2009, uh, the very conservative Pope, you know, Benefit, uh, ben, Benedict the Sixth, Sixteenth, in an audience, talks about the great contribution that Peter Abelard made. Um, so anyway, so um, so he's de he's declared a heretic. His books are burned. So this is you know so the, somehow the university emerges out of this conflict. That's just not the case. Now, Abelard, in fact. Um, uh, it's his his wonderful work, Sick at Non, this great theological work, yes and no. What a provocative title, because what he shows in this book is, is there are conflicts in the authorities. What he doesn't do, he sets them out, he doesn't reconcile them the way the Gratian tries to do, right, in the, you know, in the, in canon, he just sets them out, okay, but the way in which he sets them out in Sick at Non becomes the basis of the great theologian. Peter Lombard, and then in many respects, the basis of what Thomas Aquinas does a century later. So ultimately, the intellectual uh, movement that Abelard starts is, is victorious. Okay, so, but, you know, there's this great conflict, it's a wonderful conflict, the letters, I mean, Bernard is just out there, you know, attacking Abelard, attacking the schools, and all of this kind of stuff. Now, what's interesting, so this is the great battle, this is the great conflict, but it's over by the, it's over by the 1140s, okay? The other interesting thing about this battle is, is what happens here is the monasteries, which to some extent had dominated the intellectual tradition, had their own schools, shut down their schools to outsiders. They stopped teaching outsiders. They withdraw. This was the thing about the Cistercians. They withdraw, okay, the, con the contemplative side. You know, few men will be saved and most of them will be monks. Our job is to educate the world, but to save ourselves, okay? And secondly, they shut down their schools, and they and, and, and until the 13th century, religious members of the religious orders didn't go to the secular schools. So there was this divide. We'll see what happens again in the 13th century, okay? And this, and, and one of the things I argue is the fact that the, that the religious, that, that there are set, all scholars in the, in the Middle Ages are clerics, but there are secular clerics and there are religious clerics, those who belong to orders, religious meaning regular, regular clergy, okay? The regular clergy are out, the monks, later the Dominicans and Franciscans come, but during this period of the formation of the university, it's basically secular masters and scholars. And it's among these secular masters and scholars that this new professional identity is established, the professional identity, basically that leads to the formation of a single university. So I argue that this withdrawal of the monks, okay, and their exclusion from the schools is critical to the, to the development of professional identity. Okay, now this conflicts in the early 12th century. In my view, there continues to be too much emphasis in historical accounts of, of the university of these disputes. The one between Bernard and Abelard in the early 12th century, as well as the ones we will see in the 13th century. Okay, why, you know, well, 
you know, this is something that we historians know, okay? Um, disputes, conflicts, and battles produce lots of documentation, lots of polemics, lots of records, okay? When matters are going well, for example, when academics do what they're supposed to be doing, which is teaching and learning and writing scholarship, okay, we've got their scholarship, but there aren't a lot of records, you know, sexy records of battles and riots and people being killed and, you know, and, and people rushing off to get judgment, okay? That's more left to the intellectual historian, not to the, not, not, not to the institutional historians. And that's the case in this formative period of the university between 1150 and 1215. There were no battles. Okay, there were no there, there were no significant there were no significant disputes, but it's in this period the university is formed. Okay, so what happens during this time? The schools, both on the Ile de la Cité and the left bank, continue to expand based on growing preeminence of Paris as a place of place of study, especially in the arts, the liberal arts, and in theology. The schools of Paris drew scholars and masters from throughout Europe. Most of the known masters in Paris, the ones we can identify, the preeminent masters in this period, um, came from outside the Ile de France. They were drawn from throughout Europe, from all the way throughout, from France, from Spain, Italy, Denmark, we can identify them, okay? By 1200, when the university came into existence, it is estimated there were somewhere between three and 4,000 students studying in Paris. That was about 10% of the population of the growing city. These students were taught by it's estimated about 150 masters, about 100 of them who taught the liberal arts, probably about 20 uh, in each of law and medicine, and it's sort of interesting, eight or so in theology, okay? Uh, uh, in, in 1207, the Pope Innocent III said there could not be more than eight people licensed to teach theology in Paris at any time. This became an issue of contention, as we see in the 13th century. The idea was, was quality control and to, and to limit, in a sense, competition. Um, that, that was really the situation. So, so the schools in Paris and the city of Paris grew as Paris became a major commercial and political center. And the size, and the, and meaning the size and wealth of the city could support this great student population. Okay. John of Salisbury, when he goes, when he goes back to Paris in 1160, wow, there's plenty of food here. It's a great, I mean, you know, Paris. I wrote another article about the growth of the town and the university together, and very often it's Paris Paradisus. It's a paradise. It's a paradise for scholars. It was the best, as, you know, it goes, goes, goes back to, that's the great periods when Philip Augustus puts the, the new walls around the city. It's a wonderful time in the growth of Paris. It's a political, commercial, and educational, educational center. Okay. Um, one of the issues in Paris in this period of time, three of, that's a lot of students, three or 4,000. I mean, 10% of the population of a growing city. Um, and we know that there was some overcrowding, uh, competition for housing, a familiar story in college towns, um, which, led to, uh, uh, which led to town ground tensions, especially, town ground, especially on the left bank, where most of the younger art students lived. And there started to be, and this is the period of the first town gown battles, again, a prominent part of university history. The very first occurred in 1192 between students and residents of the Bourg Saint-Germain right near, right near the, the Church of Saint-Germain. Um, and a much more significant battle occurred in the year 1200. There was a tavern brawl. You know, again, does history ever change, okay? Involving who else but a group of German students, always the most rambunctious, okay? Um, it began in 1200 over, you know, a, a tavern keeper charged them. They claimed too much for, for the wine. Uh, and, and what do they do? They destroy the tavern uh, and they beat up the keeper, okay? So that's what happened. This led to, you know, the townspeople rising up and an assault on the German hostel, and several German students were killed uh, by the townspeople led by the royal provost. Okay, well, those of you who are students would, would love to know, probably then, but wouldn't happen now. Paris masters immediately came to the defense of their students. They suspended their lectures. They demanded redress from the king, and they threatened to shut down the schools and leave the city. Now, think about that. Well, that was pretty good, huh? Now, while, while this conflict and similar events in, this, in the 13th century seem to support the account of the early history of the university as a series of battles and struggles against authorities, it misses the importance of what happened 
which is that the king, Philip Augustus, completely supported the university. He acted swiftly and harshly. He punished the provost and the townspeople. They were arrested and imprisoned for, for life. Their homes, their gardens, and their vineyards were destroyed. On the other hand, none of the students were punished. Okay? Of more enduring importance, the king granted the university its first royal charter, giving scholars important legal privileges and assuring them of continued royal support. The charter included requiring all the citizens of Paris, as well as the provost, to swear by oath in the presence of the scholars in conspectus scholarium to recognize the clerical status of all scholars, that they were, that they recognize that they were subject to the church, church courts and not royal courts, and like other, like other clerics, could not be punished by bodily harm. They could be imprisoned, but they could not be, bodily harm was very frequently used. Notably, although the legal privileges recognized by the charter were the same as those that existed for other clerics, they were subject to ecclesiastical courts and they could not suffer corporal punishment, the privileges were addressed specifically and exclusively to scholars. The charter explicitly states that these privileges and the requirement of this oath, which took place in front of the students, didn't apply to other, cler other clerics in the city, such as all the priests and so forth at the cathedrals. Scholars were recognized by the king in 1200 as a distinct professional group with their own special status, rights, and privileges. The independence of the university. We shall see similar results and the disputes from the 13th century, so often cited as evidence of battles or struggles of the university against authorities for their independence and freedom. In each case, the authorities recognized the special status of the university and affirmed or reaffirmed its rights and privileges, including its right of self-governance. So this brings us to the church and ecclesiastical officials who had direct uh, or indirect and if it's the Pope, distant authority over the schools of Paris. Again, the bad guys, particularly in these late 19th century liberal historian views. I mean, the, the, the oppression of the, you know, particularly of the Catholic Church, of, of anything enlightened, okay? Now, what's interesting, so, so who are these ecclesiastical authorities? The chancellors, who, who, the chancellors of Notre Dame, the Bishop of Paris, and the Popes. Well, who were these people in this period of time? Okay. Chancellors figure prominently in the history of universities. Um, 13th century, there were some interesting chancellors, interesting, well, I, I'm, I'm going to not go on. We can talk about that later. Okay. And then you have this whole situation of where in England, what's interesting is uh, the chancellors are a bit of a problem in Paris in the 13th century, the same time that, that, um, that Oxford and Cambridge are emerging. Okay, but the interesting thing is, is that Oxford and Cambridge don't have chancellors because Oxford and Cambridge in the 13th century don't have cathedrals. So when chancellors come into existence, they come in existence within the universities rather than authorities outside of you. So it's sort of a different history, but this sort of structure, the history of chancellors and universities is, is another interesting story. Okay, but what's interesting is, is that basically, that, so the chancellor of the cathedral had jurisdiction over the schools in Paris although there was an exclusion in the left bank because the abbot of saint jean Bieb had certain authority, which comes up in the 13th century, okay? And basically, if you wanted to teach in Paris, you had to get a, a, a license, a license to teach from the chancellor or from the abbot of saint, saint jean Bieb, okay? Um, so again, in, in the 13th century, there's some conflicts that we'll come back to, but what's overlooked and misunderstood is that during the formative years of the university, which, I, which is the latter part of the 12th century, okay, the chancellors were not adversaries of the schools, they were supporters of the schools, okay? Five of the six men who held the position of chancellor between 1150 and 1209 had themselves been masters of theology in the Paris schools. And each of them was a renowned 
preacher whose sermons we have, and I spent a good part of my book, they, they, they preach sermons in Paris to scholars talking about their ideas of education and supporting their views, their strong views about the important role of schools to the church and to society, okay? Uh, so, so a lot, so we know what these people thought, okay, from their writings, and we know they didn't do anything negative towards the schools because there are no conflicts. So, 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 so it's not this story of this battle. These people from their outward expression and from their acts were supporters of the schools, okay? What about the bishops, okay? What about the bishops? Uh, two, during these formative years of the university, two renowned, renowned Paris theologians served as successive bishops of Paris. First, Peter Lombard, the great Peter Lombard, one of the great theologians between Abelard and Thomas Aquinas, bishop from 1158 to 1166, and then Maurice of Sully, who had been a theologian. But Maurice of Sully, who's the one who began the building of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, which we're now seeing being, being rebuilt, okay? Also, their, their successor, uh, who was Odo, Odo Sully from 1196 to 1208, was equally supportive of the schools, okay? These bishops in this period of time, they, they, two of them were graduates of the schools, supported, they, and they all appointed, they, they appointed as their chancellors, and they had the appointment of the chancellors, they appointed chancellors, all people who did masters of theology. Opposition to the schools? No. Okay. No conflicts, no adversity, no battles in this period of time when the university is formed. What about those nasty 19th century view, those nasty people called popes? Okay. Again, this is the 19th century view. Even scholars like Rashdall and Peterson recognize the positive role that certain popes played in the history of the, of, the, of the university, Innocent III from 1198 to 1216 and Gregory IX. And I'll talk about them a little bit later. Okay, and, and, and these, these are the popes who gave, who recognized the rights and privileges uh, of the scholars and masters in Paris and basically established um, their independent legal status and freedom. But still, so many accounts of the history of universities are seen through the prism, okay, of earlier popes. Remember, like Innocent II, who declared Abelard a heretic, and his successor, Eugenius II, a Cistercian, who basically an instigation, instigation of, of, uh, of, of Bernard, uh, basically uh, condemned uh, another great theologian, Gilbert of Poitiers. Too, too often overlooked or mis mischaracterized, is the Pope, I was not talking about a lot, is the Pope Alexander III, who was Pope from 1159 to 1181, this very critical period of time. Uh, in my book, there was a common view that he had, he had studied at Paris. He never studied at Paris, okay? He was trained as a theologian and a canon lawyer in Bologna. We know that. He spent a good part of his time in France, however, because there was a schism at this time, and he couldn't, there were two rival popes, one supported in Italy by Frederick by Barbarossa, and Alexander spent a lot, a lot of his time close to Paris and, and got to know a lot of what was going on in the schools. Now, you know, when you look at accounts of Alexander, he did, one of the things he did, he was a trained theologian, is that basically he tried unsuccessfully to condemn, to have condemned is, and that's the term that's used, but it really is to declare inconsistent with authority certain teachings of Peter Apple, Peter Lombard, okay, great theologian and bishop, certain teachings on Christology. Now, this is made into a big deal in the late 19th, it's always condemning, but this is a situation. Is, there was a lot of debate and discourse going on in the schools in the 12th century. People came down a different side of issues, okay, and, you know, at times, there was an effort to say, no, this is what's consistent with the authority of the father. So this is a period of time there's this jockeying going. It wasn't, he wasn't condemning Peter Abelard. I mean, Peter Lombard, the way, uh, the way earlier Peter Abelard had been condemned. It was really to say that certain specific teachings just were inconsistent with authority and they should be banned from the schools. That was, that was, that was the limitation. But, but basically, when this pope is looked, this critical pope in this period is looked at, he's seen as one of these this continuing conflict. What's overlooked are, are things that Alexander did in support of the scholars in Paris. Two, two important things in support of scholars in the debate. First of all, it was Alexander III in resolving a conflict, town down conflict that happened not in Paris, but in the city of Rennes in, in 1172. He established the principle in a bull that the masters 
okay, and not other ecclesiastical authorities have the legal jurisdiction over the conduct of scholars. No one, he ordered, should, quote, dare to molest these scholars against their liberty, their liberty, note the term, in any way, as long as they were prepared to submit to the jurisdiction of their masters. A very, very important principle. This established the precedence of the independence of the scholars, even though they were clerks, from other ecclesiastical authorities, and basically the recognition of special legal status that prevailed. Second, the other thing that Alexander did was he took important steps to provide for the financial support of both masters and scholars. Again, long thing to talk about. Uh, Professor Evans talked a little bit about this last time. So basically, he ordered by papal mandate that that basically he basically he 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 we see him intervening several times to basically to provide uh, theology masters with income from the diocese with prebends to make sure that they continue to teach in the schools because the university didn't pay people at that at that point they had to get independent support from the diocese or they were paid directly by students. Secondly, Alexander issued a decree saying that every cathedral church had to designate revenues to support a master to teach students without charging fees, okay, because right, because a lot of masters were paid by the students. And third, he should decree in 1179 prohi prohibiting chancellors from requiring qualified masters to pay a fee to obtain a license to teach, okay? Those, he who sells the license to teach strives to impede the progress of the church. There was actually this view expressed on a lot of these sermons I told you about that, that basically that, that scholars, you know, simony was basically selling things, that, that education shouldn't be sold, it should be freely available, okay? This was some of the principles. So anyway, that was Alexander III. But the, really the key pope in one is, is, is Innocent III, okay? 1198 to 1216, the great reform pope, uh, during whose pontificate and with great support, the nascent University of Paris achieved its independent status and right to regulate its own affairs. Innocent came from a Roman noble family. His family produced not less than, not fewer than nine popes uh, in the 12th and 13th century. He had been a student of theology in Paris. So he came from, he's come from south, south of Rome, very uh, prominent family, made his way to Paris and studied for a while. Okay, so great support of the schools. A new chancellor, uh, uh, in, in 1209, there was a new chancellor called John of Candell, just became chancellor. He departed from, the, from his predecessors and really tried to get greater control uh, over the schools by requiring masters to obtain the license the, the license to teach, the license to go which you had to get from the chancellor, by requiring them to swear obedience and fidelity to him. And sometimes charging them a fee and also trying to reassert legal authority over scholars in contradiction to the decrees of Alexander III. In response, Innocent III wrote indignantly, when I studied in Paris, I never saw scholars treated in this way. That's a pope who's trying to repress the schools, oppress the schools, hardly at all. Under his direction, uh, under, under his, uh, <clears throat> so, so basically, and under his direction requiring oaths and fees or any other compensation for a master seeking a licentiate of candy was prohibited and strict limitations were placed on the chancellor's legal authority over scholars. These were both important steps in establishing the independence and nascent university from local social clear. So clear, came down firmly on the side of the scholars, their independence, their rights and privileges, okay? What's more important with Innocent III, okay, uh, is his recognition of the rights of the Paris masters to regulate their own affairs. And this was, for, this was expressed in a bull that he issued in 1208 and 1209 called Ex Literis Vestry. Now, this is an important landmark in the history of the university. It provides the earliest evidence of collective evidence taken by the masters of Paris. We learn from the papal bull that masters of three faculties, theology, the arts, and, 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 and law, medicine is missing here, we don't quite know why, 
They had acted shortly before then together, okay, and agreed upon to establish a common set of statutes, rules for the university. And then all of the masters who taught in Paris were required to take a sworn oath to submit to these rules in order to remain or to be admitted uh, into what was referred to in the bull as the Universitas Magistrora, okay? The University of Masters. The, the bull was issued by the Pope to resolve the case of a certain liberal arts master called Master G, so all said, who had refused to take the oath, had been expelled from the university, and was seeking to be readmitted. Now, the statute said they could expel, but the statutes didn't say anything about where they could be readmitted. So what did the university do? It went to the Pope and said, can we readmit? Okay. It's a technical, could they be readmitted? The Pope's decision was that if the masters were satisfied with Master G's amends, they had full authority to readmit him into their, in this case, consortium magistrali, so Universitas Consortium. Now, this bull provides unambiguous evidence, in my view, that a nascent university consisting of the first, the three principal faculties that, that existed in 1208, law, arts, and, 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 and theology, that the masters were acting collectively to establish rules to regulate their own affairs, and that, they're, that they have independent legal status and rights to make and enforce their rules and control membership of their consortium magistralibus, and these were recognized by the Pope. Now, these statutes don't exist. All we know about those statutes, okay, they don't survive, all we know is the limited detail that's provided in the papal bull, the papal decree. And here's what we're told, that after several young masters teaching the liberal arts had deviated from established norms, okay? And what were those established norms, okay? What they wore and how and what they taught, when they scheduled their classes, the ordering of their lectures and their disputations, the two standards of medieval pedagogy, and their refusal to cancel classes to attend the funerals of their deceased colleagues. Those were the things that the statutes were about, according, according to the papal bull. So basically, they'd, re they'd, re they'd, re they'd, refuse, they'd, they'd refuse to do that, okay? And that's how the dispute had happened. Now, what's interesting is why these matters, okay? And what do these matters tell us about the formation of the university and its professional identity. And that's what I want to talk. And this brings us to the first university statutes that do survive, those from 1215, 1215, those adopted by decree of the papal legate, Robert of Courson. Now you have those statutes. You can look at them, they're takeaways. These are the first extant university statutes, okay? Uh, the earliest other statutes we have are university are those for Cambridge University in 1250. Okay, so look at them and we'll talk about it. the prevailing view of these statutes. When I wrote my book and I published a, I did a separately published article, was that uh, uh, the prevailing view was that they were a set of rules and regulations imposed upon the university from the outside, in this case by the church through the papal legate. Another example of external affairs and the internal affairs of Paris, affairs of Paris masters and evidence uh, that the university's formation was a struggle to assert control over academic freedom. I read them very differently, okay? In my view, these really are, in some sense, the university's Magna Carta, okay? Probably the most important document in the early history of universities, okay? Um, you, so you have them. Um, just a, just, a, just a few just a few counts. So, so the central figure here is the papal legate, Robert of Courson. Okay. Um, you know, we know little about him other than he's an Englishman who came to Paris uh, as, as a student and became a preeminent uh, theology master. Okay. Uh, he was one of these, these moral theologians, these moralists in the late 12th century, he's particularly known as someone who basically, and this is a great change in the late 12th century taking theology from being sort of theoretical 
okay and and and, and basically being much more addressing much more practical and concrete questions that came up in people's lives so one of his one of his uh, his, his great the theological work uh, um, uh, like all the called called the summa one of the issues he addresses is usury right you have this prohibition of usury in the old testament well you know developing commercial city Money is going to be lent, and interest is going to be charged. And how do you justify? These are the kinds of issues that Robert of Corson uh, dealt with. Um, he was very successful. He was he's, he's, he's frequently um, uh, 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 made a, a papal judge delegate. He took an active role in the schools and the Athens affairs. He's basically early 13th century of an academic rock star. Okay, okay, he's out. There, okay, and you know, in 1215. After he does the statues, he goes. He goes to Rome. He's at the Fourth Lateran Council. He goes on the Fourth Crusade. He's just one of those, you know, acad academic rock stars. But before he goes off to the left, he basically, we know, just before in the summer of 1215, okay, he comes to Paris with an apparent mandate to the Pope to go to the schools and help them out. Okay, 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 and the result of these statues. Okay. Now, it's pretty clear if you look at the statutes and just read through them, just to glance at them, they're not systematic or comprehensive. They're an, ex they're an eclectic array of matters, some obviously of great importance to the functioning of a university, others seemingly less so. Some matters are treated in great details, others only in passing. What do we make of them? Okay. I think the statutes can only be understood as a product of excessive debate and negotiation, discussion between Robert and delegates from the faculties at the university, all four faculties. Um, and basically it went on and there's a bit of compromise here, okay? They tell us what Robert and the masters could agree on, how they could act together and where they shared a common view and were able to reach a consensus of what matters needed to be addressed as the preface states, quote, to better the condition of students and provide for tranquility in the schools. Again, better condition for tranquility in the sense you don't want, the, there's disputatio, but you don't want too much conflict. I mean, that's the situation here. So what do we have? You've got the statutes. We can delve into them in any way you want. The matters that they cover can be summarized as follows. Qualifications for teaching and for obtaining the licentia docendi. The, the curriculum for teaching the liberal arts, particularly for, which is more prescriptive than proscriptive. Academic dress and deportment. Attendance at funerals, and those three things I just talked about, all things that were in the earlier statutes, town non relations, and self governance. I just want to highlight a couple of them. Self governance. The statutes recognized and reconfirmed principles of academic self governance that had been evolving in the final years of the 12th century. Students were placed directly under the control, the legal jurisdiction of their masters. We've seen the precedents in papal decrees. What was new in the 1215 statute? was that no student was to be allowed to remain in Paris who was not willing to submit to the authority of a specific master. The independence of masters from external authorities was protected by a renewal of a papal decree that had been issued in 1213, stipulating that no monetary payment, oath, or, or anything else, any precondition was required for the license to teach. And moreover, there was express confirmation of the right of the university to make and enforce its own statutes. Now, the provision to confirm this right requires further attention. The rule states in the, that the masters and students have the rights to make rules and regulations, obligaciones and constituciones, and they have the right to enforce those rules by solemn oath and appropriate punishment. And it talks about the kind of things that rules can be made on. What, if a, what to do if a student is killed, mutilated, or injured, and justice is not done by civil authorities? Setting what rents were to be charged for academic lodgings and academic dress, the burial of colleagues, and the scheduling of lectures, lectures and disputations. A rather odd list, isn't it? I think it's meant to be illustrative. It's the kind of issues that had come up and disrupted the schools that need to be rules to provide for tranquility. Okay, the purpose of the statutes in referencing these matters was to recognize the authority of the university over matters that mattered most, okay, to the masters because they'd interrupted the the tranquil the tranquility of 
learning and they'd adversely affect, affected the lives of their students. This right of self-governance was to be exercised to degree states so the university might not be dissolved or destroyed. I read this as a justification, not uh, as, as both a justification and an exhortation. The university was given a clear mandate for which there was precedent in papal decree of 1208, of 1209, of responsible self-government. Okay. Now, in this regard, it's very interesting. The statutes say the following. The statutes state that any intentional violation of prescribed rules and regulations by masters of students, okay, if you violated the rules, if you were master of student, you were to be excommunicated by a okay, if within 15 days of the violation, you did not appear and make amends before the entire university or before a smaller group constituted by the university to hear such cases. Now, significantly, it made no difference which faculty, what you studied, your, your jurisdiction was under the entire university. Jurisdiction in all cases rested with the university as a whole. That is in all the faculties acting together, a single corporate body enforcing its own rules with the authority of the church, the debate executed, the executed by order of the Pope. Okay. Um, the other thing in here, funerals. Okay. These funerals, you know, rituals, we know from, rituals are an important part of university identity. And this funeral thing is part of that. The corporate identity. What do the rules say? It's really interesting. Okay. What, they, what do the rules require? They say that basically, in the case of the death of a student, whether the student is a student of arts or theology, half of the arts masters are to go to the first funeral and the other half are to go to the next funeral and classes are not to be canceled. But they're required all to go to the funerals of a student, okay? But classes were to continue, okay? In the case of the death of a master of either arts or theology, Everybody was to go to the funeral, and the day of burial, the university was to be shut down. Okay, so why? The other thing is, if you look at the if you look at the Cambridge Statute in 1250, there's also a, a, a lot of detail about funerals, rituals, just like convocations and commencement, an expression of the professional identity of masters. Okay, it's an important basic of, of basically this confirmation of a corporate identity of the autonomy of the of, of the integrity. Okay, so that's that's what I, that's what I see in these. Okay, and they're really trying to enforce this. Okay, by legal authority and statutory authority, but also by rituals, the way universities continue continue to do. The other big part of these statutes is what it says about teaching. Now, one of the things is if you'll see, there are certain books in there that are prohibited and if this is the 19th they focused they focused on those they focused on those things but there's much more here about teaching what should be taught in the university how when and by whom what they ought to wear okay um, and all of that kind of stuff okay so 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 basically and and, and this i argue is that if you really start, there's much more here about about teaching uh, and the common interest of teaching, as we'll see, as we'll see, as we'll see, in, as we'll see in the 13th century. So that's what I have to say about the statutes. You can ask questions about the statutes when we get back. Okay. So what I argue in my book is that basically the common identity, the professional identity that led to the formation of a single university among among the among among the among the four disciplines was grounded in the master's consciousness and their in the, of their duties and responsibilities as teachers. Uh, it expl you know, explains to me, if we look at the statutes, you know, they came together to form these statutes of what drew the masses of dis different disciplines together to form and act as a single university and community. It was not that they had to join together to have larger forces against external authorities, which is like 19th century view, but rather they shared a common identity, which was based in their responsibilities as teaching teachers and their rights of self-governance. Self so... That's sort of where I end my book, and I talk about how these ideals, you know. But now I want to talk a little bit about these two episodes in the 13th century. I'll just take a, I'll just take a few more minutes because this is this is where. So the two episodes of the 13th century, because they're so telling. Um, so basically, and 
And, and again, you know, uh, scholars like Rashdell and Peterson uh, basically describe these episodes as evidence of the university's battle for survival. But I believe they can better be understood as testimonies of the enduring strength of the university formed by the Paris masters at the end of at the end of the 12th, the beginning of the 13th century, the secure foundation of the educational principle upon which the university was built. Now, each of these events was evolved because of a town gown rivalry, both in the great dispersion of 1229, 1231, excuse me, and the crisis of 1253 and 55. Okay, town, town gown disper disturbances, just like the one in 1200 that led to the privileges from the, from the, from the King Philip Augustus. Let's, let, these are sort of fun. I'll try, to, I'll try to keep it brief. The first episode began, you know, think about it. I mean, things don't change. It's carnival. February 1229, when students, again, were overcharged for wine, okay? Uh, town gown riots ensued for two days before royal troops were sent in and, and several innocent students were killed. That's the way they described. Uh, a lot more of them were hauled off to royal prisons, exactly contradicting their right you know, to ecclesia. The Paris masters outraged by what they regarded as a clear violation of the royal privilege of 1200 immediately suspended all classes. Can you imagine that happening now? I mean, just think, just think professors like me saying, let's just dispense with classes because some students got beat up, up downtown. I don't think it would happen. In March 1229, the university drew up a formal protest and threatened to require all masters to leave Paris. Okay? The university drew a formal protest and threatened to require all masters to leave Paris for not less than six years unless they received full redress by May 15th. What they described is the atrocious injuries suffered by their students from the royal troops. When no action was taken by the Queen Regent, Louis the Louis the uh, Saint Louis Louis the Ninth was still uh, underage, so he hadn't assumed the crown. Um, uh, before the deadline, a significant num number of masters and students left Paris. Lots of them, most of them left. Okay, some of them, at the invitation of King Henry the Third, went to Oxford. And then on to Cambridge, which was found about that time. And this is what led to the great prestige of both those places. Um, and then others went to other schools in the Ile de France, Angers, Orléans, Rennes, and Toulouse. And we have this wonderful thing. I mean, this is great. Toulouse, the citizens of Toulouse, the scholars of Toulouse, write this wonderful letter saying, come to Toulouse, okay? You have freedom here. There's tranquility here. And it's cheaper in Toulouse to live in Toulouse than it is in Paris. So they're trying to get everybody, everybody to go there. Um, the impact of the dispersal and threat to Paris, losing its prestige, as well as the commercial benefits of having two to 3,000 uh, students there, now at this point, it's, it's, it's even more than that, led the quick action to the monarchy to get the students back to Paris. And in August 1229, the royal privileges previously granted by Philip Augustus were reaffirmed and the charter of 1200 was reissued. So pretty swift action, given that you get this regency going on. It took longer for the Pope now it's Gregory the Ninth, who was farther away to act. But as a, again, he also was a former student at Bo both at Bologna and Paris. And he, like Innocent III, was infuriated, okay, and expressed his, he have, we have a series of, of bulls that he addressed uh, to the bishop, uh, to the queen regent, to others from, from November 12, 1229, ordering them to do everything necessary to redress the grievances of the masters and get the university reestablished in Paris as soon as possible. Still, it took him for a while to, under, to, to basically resolve the issues, and he issued a famous bull in 1231 called Parents Scientiarum, which some people argue is the magic card of the university. I don't take that view. Because what's interesting about this bull issued in 1231, it's illegal privileges granted by the Pope were not new, okay? They, it was a reaffirmation of the independence of the university and its previous established rights of self-governance, including the right of the university to enact its own statutes, the right of the university to expel those members, masters and students who refuse to abide by the statutes, procedures for granting of the license, the license to teach that guaranteed that masters would be consulted and they could give, so basically they had to be consulted, and the masters could give confidential information about those people who were candidates, and it would be protected, it, it, it would be guaranteed. Um, and above all, the right of the masters to strike, 
to suspend their classes and shut down the university for any bodily injury or excess inflicted upon anyone, uh, or even if a scholar was ejected, uh, was was evicted uh, from uh, from 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 his house, from his uh, if redress was not obtained from local authorities within fifteen days. Okay, how I characterize this episode is not as many historians have done as a challenge to or battle for the survival of the university, but as evidence of the enduring strength of the institution, whose members had a common professional identity that enabled them to act together and decisively to advance their interests, and who could count on both the king and the pope to support them by recognizing and reaffirming rights and privileges they've been granted and considered to be theirs and enduring. So watch just one more episode, because this one is fun too. But it's just a completely different world because now we're in the 1250s. Again, it's precipitated by a town down disturbance, a riot which left one student dead and several other students jailed. Same story. In response, the university exercised its right to strike, okay, uh, and ordered the cancellation, cessatio of all classes, okay, um, just as they had in, in 1229. What complicated the, the situation in the 1250s, however, was the arrival in Paris, starting in the 1220s, of all these Dominicans and Franciscans, members of religious orders, these two new mendicant orders, okay, who, who, who basically established houses there. And in those houses, they taught theology, okay? And so basically what happened is before long, there were masters of theology, Dominican and Franciscan masters of theology who had licenses to teach and were technically part of the University of Paris. And they were followed by others, Augustinians and even Cistercians. Now, they're religious. They're members of religious orders. They have different status and they have different situations. The different statuses, they are parts of orders. They've taken vows to their orders, you know, you know, we won't go in, you know what they are, and they're in different situations. If you're a member of an order, okay, you are supported financially, housed financially by that order, okay? If you're a secular, non-secular master, you either got to get one of these prebends, most of which were limited in duration, or you get fees from your students, okay? Plus you're, plus you're independent, okay? So there were tensions beginning in the 1220s between the religious masters and the, and the secular masters. These tensions came to a head when the Dominican and Franciscan theologians refused to join the, and, 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 you could, and they could only teach theology, they were not allowed to teach the arts, when they refused to join the strike called by the university, which the secular masters insisted they had an obligation to do based on the privileges granted in parents scantiarum. What did the Franciscans and Dominicans do? They appealed to the Pope, okay? Um, so they appealed to the Pope. So, so basically, this, basically the, strike, the strike failed, okay? Um, the, the university tried to enforce it. They passed a resolution saying that all masters had to take an oath to support the university and its demand for justice. And when the mendicant masters refused, they were expelled from the university. By action, of the, they were expelled by the rest of the masters from the universities, and students were strictly forbidden to attend the lectures of the, of, of, the, of the Dominican and Franciscan theologians. Matters escalated when in 1253, April of 1253, the university unanimously, unanimously passed a resolution stating that no one could be admitted or readmitted as master of the university unless he swore an oath to abide by the university statutes and agreed expressly to take part in strikes agreed to by the university. There's a new Pope though, Gregory the Ninth. Um, actually, there's a new Pope, Innocent the Fourth, who succeeded Gregory the Ninth. He didn't side with the university. Instead, he issued an order that issued an order that the expelled mendicants had to be immediately reinstated. Boy, did this lead to this led to some heated. And I want to talk about two letters that were written by the masters at this time, because this gets you into their heads about how they saw themselves. The first is an open letter. They, the masters of all four faculties, they met together in the church of San Julian La Povra, which was the university church at that point, and they agreed, okay? And they sent this letter to everybody in Western Christendom, saying, you've got to come to our defense. Um, 
That's the so. And then the second letter is the letter they sent in February 1253. I'm sorry, in uh, in October 1255 to the to the uh, 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 to the to the Pope. Um, uh, uh, soon after, he issued a bull called Quasi Lingam Vitae that commanded the university and commanded the university to reinstate the expelled mendicant masters. The letter of 1253 is often cited for its long diatribe against the mendicants. It's nasty, the, the mendicants, okay. Evidence of the intense competition in the theology factor between, between these two factions. Uh, these were indeed intense professional rivalry, rivalries, but they were not, as some historians have suggested, a real threat to the survival of the university. What I find most notable about this lengthy missive, full of polemics about the harms and injuries being perpetrated by the fires, Prior to the account it gives of the formation of the university in its glorious past. Universities love to tell his, their histories, their glorious past. Okay, now threatened by what's called the, the rebellion and contumacy of the friars. Comparing the four theology, uh, the, the four faculties, theology, jurisprudence, medicine, and philosophy, to the four rivers of paradise flowing from a single wisdom and forming a venerable and wholesome gymnasium, okay, that they use all these, this is how they do, there were once, there once were masters who were men of revered life, most illustrious, most illustrious in learning, religious in mind, all clad in secular garb, so they're talking, secular, but they mean not lay, they mean secular clergy, who having become more numerous as the numbers of students increased in time, as it should, in order that they could devote themselves the more freely and, tr and tranquilly to learn and study. Again, consider, remember what we've seen, associated by a bond of special law. They formed an organization. Obtained from king and pope a corporate college or, or university with many privileges and indulgences. No, they formed it and they were supported by the external authorities. This is how they tell their own history. It's not a history of battles, okay? Okay, under the happy regime of these masters, the said university grew and blossomed into a most beautiful flower that bore the riches and full honors because just as they differed, neither in costume or profession, so they varied not in studies or vows. The four faculties, not different, notice this commonality, separating themselves from the regular because the irregular have other vows. I believe that this reflects the strong shared professional identity I've been talking about that brought about the formation of Paris as a single university encompassing the four faculties with the encouragement and support not in opposition or to assert themselves against of lay and ecclesiastical authorities who granted them privileges and above all the rights of self-government governance. The masters see the events of 1253 as a departure from this history, a break with the past, urging the addressees to take action against the friars, quote, lest if that foundation of the church known, foundation of the church known as the University of Paris, the foundation of the church is shaken, the entire edifice is going to sink in ruin. Okay. The letter to Alexander IV in 1255, signed by, again, by all the masters, all the faculties, all the students, and also by the four nations, which is another issue we talk about, was no less forceful in reflecting the, the and rejecting the Pope's attempted compromises and attacking the bull as damaging to the historical privileges of the university. What I want to focus on in concluding is the university's response to the Pope's command that they reinstate. The Pope said, you need to reinstate. I order you to reinstate the mendicant masters. This is what they said. The mendicants could and would not be admitted as commanded by the Pope because the university has been formed not by force, violentium, but by friendship. Amicitium, and no one can be compelled to become a member of the society or, or detained against his will. The university was clear and confident of its status as a free and independent association governed by its own rules and zealous in protecting all the rights and privileges it had been previously granted. 
The university's letter to the Pope concluded with a warning that masters and scholars had been leaving Paris and more would follow and the university could be irreparably damaged if the Pope did not revoke his actions. Quote, we cannot admit them into our society according to their present state with a clear conscience. You know, we would rather transfer our interest to another kingdom or else we could not, if we could not do that because you would forbid us, we would choose to abandon our desire, return to our home, enjoy our native liberty rather than be forcibly and dangerously suffocated by what you've ordered. This warning, or maybe it's a threat, that many of the masters and scholars would disperse as they did in 1229-31 and jeopardize the university did not happen, okay? The university was a lot more secure in the 1250s than it was in the 1220s because among other things, these various colleges had been formed. It's about this time the College of the Sorbonne was formed. The College of the Sorbonne was a house, a building, for secular masters and students of theology. And there were several others of those in Paris. So a lot harder to, now the, so, so, so they don't, there isn't the dispo, dispersal like there was massive leaving of Paris. The Pope's initial response to, to this letter uh, in, in 1255, December 12, was to tell, order the Bishop of Paris, excommunicate any masters who did not accept the rules he laid down in his bull. There's no evidence that this order was ever enforced by the bishop, okay? As masters seem to have calmed down, now that while the university's position remained that the regular masters could not be readmitted, okay, those who had been expelled, uh, who, who could, could, not, could not be readmitted unless they were willing to take the oath to abide by the university statutes, the university bit its time and showed confidence and wisdom of not forcing the issue when they could not count on the support of the Pope, okay? As they could in the past. So what happened? You look at the late 13th century, although the oath issue remained unresolved, the conflict simmered down, and over the next decades, the secular and religious masters basically learned to live with one another. And if anybody knows, if you know what, the latter part of the 13th century. It's a glorious period of theologians in Paris. This is when Thomas Aquinas is in Paris and St. Bonaventure's, the great Franciscan Bonaventure. And basically they are stellar teachers. And what happens when you have people like Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure, as well as the other masters, you draw all kinds, so all kinds of students. Paris secures its preeminence as the greatest institution for learning both theology uh, and the arts. It, so Paris grew during this period. And basically the masters learned to live with one another. And no one forced this issue of the oath, okay, during this period of time. The issue of the oath was not resolved until 1318. When the Mendicants, okay, so the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Augustinians, and notably the Cistercians, basically all agreed to accept the requirement of taking the oath to abide by the statutes of the university that had led to the dispute in 1253. And there's just this, there's this wonderful, we agree to do this, okay? How did that happen? Why did that happen? This was, I believe, a reconfirmation of the university's right of self-governance and independence, which had endured all of the challenges, the co conflicts, if you will, of the 13th century, okay? As well as a recognition by those members of the theology faculty who are members of the religious orders, the mendicants, the Sturgeons, and Augustinians, of the importance of these privileges and rights, that those privileges and rights were as critical to them as much as to the secular masters who formed the university and so ardently defended those privileges. It's critical to them to secure the mission of the university, the mission of the university the advancement of knowledge and understanding. And it is on this basis that Paris secured its position of preeminence as well as the model for the enduring educational institution of the university. Anyway, that's, I went on for far too long. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I did. But anyway, questions, I mean, about the statutes or anything like that. 
two short questions. The first, historiographical in nature. Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, the difficulty of finding sources in times of peace versus in discourse. So I'm curious as to what sources you were relying on and how you're reading those sources, um, particularly in that early period of the university. Um, and then my second question, going to the first of the cases you mentioned near the end there about 12, uh, late 1220s, um, I'm wondering how much you can read that as Gregory the Ninth trying to assert the modicum of authority because he's having a really difficult time in Italy at that point with Cathars and the Lombard League. So I'm curious how much you can read that incident more as um, sort of the stop call, if you will, of I can support this university and they'll back me up and give me more legitimacy when I'm struggling to assert. No, I, I think the Pope said it's the case of Gregory the Ninth is more since third is that you needed as many allies uh, as you could basically to fight the real to fight the real heretics, right? You know, and, and you look at it as in the third embrace of Francis. You know, like the book that I was working on I left academia was a book on innocent Francis. And it was inspired, it was inspired by the book of Joko Fresco. Is if you've been you, and you know the story, it, it's illustrated, which is basically when innocent first goes when innocent first I'm sorry when Francis first goes to innocent He's sent away. And then I love this. It's one of my favorites. Innocent has a dream. You know, this dream is a, 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 Christian, a Christian story. He has a wonderful dream. And he sees Francis holding up the church of St. John Lateran, which is falling down. And that is really symbolic of people like Innocent and, and also is that, is that people like Francis who came to the papacy okay, and asked for support and were willing to and submit. Well, remember, the Francis rule, Francis wrote his rule, but he did, you know, it's his rule, just like it's the Paris statute, but the Pope authorized it because it's critical. You know, they recognize they need these forces, okay, both the kind of Franciscan, the regional, and then the university basically to fight against the real problems. And so I think, I think that's the, that's, that's the attitude. And I think that sometimes those battles get confused with where, where, where there's sort of a youth in the schools that these disputations are going too far. You know, the, 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 the medieval university, as you pointed out so well in, in, in last week, and, and the law schools, as well as well as the, there was disputation, okay? That basically there was people arguing back and forth in different positions, okay? And as long as there was tranquility and it kept within certain boundaries, it was okay, okay? So I think there was, that, that's what's time, that, that's what sometimes is mistaken. I mean, the other thing is, and, and, and my view is, you know, so I sat down and in fact, this wonderful thing is called the Chocolatari University of Paris Paris Sciences that was on the 19th century. So this wonderful source, which I used to have to go and go to the library. Now you can pull it up online. It'll really be wonderful. Okay, and you sort of read through this stuff. And it's the prison, you know, it's when I, when I was at Oxford and I, I started reading these things, I, I sort of read them and I thought about it. The other thing that I really, really enlightening uh, are these, and this is where my work is most novel, are all these sermons from the late 12th century written by all these great and influential theologians, okay, who played a very significant role. And, and this is a period of time that, that, that this is the great uh, period of moral, the morals, the moral theologians. I mean, again, this is speaking broad, you know, the early history, you know, the dominance of theology in the church is this eschatology and the idea is you would draw up in the world to be saved, okay? The moral theologians, the, John Paul wrote a great book about this, late 12th century. It's basically how to live better lives. And they, they wrote these sermons called Sermonius at Stavros. They basically said different people, different status points in their life, different well, that kind of stuff. how though different people, like merchants, could live good lives, how students, scholars, and masters. So all of these sermons address the scholars and masters. Okay, they're all in 12th and 13th century English. That was a very important source that I looked at. And it showed these people you know, who became the chancellors for these great, what they thought about education, the importance of education, and the standards by which masters should conduct themselves. And so I didn't talk about the parts of my time, chapters on my books on, on satirists of the 12th century. 12th century is a great period of, of Latin satire, on the humanists like John of Salisbury, okay, and then on what I call these moralists, so these preachers, and all their sources. There's a lot of discussion about what's going on in the schools, what's good and what's bad. Okay, so there were those sources, and you take those against these official documents, which often talks about where there, where there are conflicts and battles, and you and you you try to make you try to make a whole. 
Start that one down. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Focus. There's a lot. There's a lot. That's what's so interesting. I mean, you realize that there's so much discussion. People are aware of what's going on. You know, all these people come to the schools and these schools are open and this, it's not people combining themselves in monasteries. It's a big change. But there's this change going on, okay? And they're, they're, they're trying to come, come to terms with it. And, and, that's, and, and, and it seems to me that if you sort of look at that in that context, particularly in this period, the late 12th century, you got you to take that period of time when this, it's, these institutions really get formed and understand what's motivating them in that period. Um, one thing I want, you really stress this idea of self governance, mm -hmm. right? And I'm, I'm just wondering if it's, is it this, is it, is it like this? It's a philosopher question, like an Aristotelian idea of a practice, right? And we're teachers and we know what we need to do yeah. to be good teachers. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's kind of how yeah, it's. We set the curriculum and we set the standards yeah. for our students. And we, we also set the standards like who's allowed to teach. Okay. Okay. Right. We're the ones to judge the qualifications. And no one should be admitted. I mean, it says they are no one, and this is the struggle a little bit of the 13th century. I mean, the masters are really showing no one should be able to teach unless we put them before the chancellor. Okay. So and that, that, that really that that sort of remains. Is that the hiring kind of that you're talking about? No, it's just, I mean, you're basically, you know, you needed this license to teach in the diocese. Right, right. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And the masters were trying to assert, well, no one should be allowed. We're not gonna allow anybody to our faculties unless. Unless the license is granted with our approval, gotcha. and that was that remained a, a bit uncertain. I, yeah, sorry. So following up on that is, you know, last week we talked the idea of what does the university produce, and what the models it is. And you're stating a guild model, yeah. and when we look particularly at this issue of who gets the executive committee, um, can we think of this as a guild product of which is new masters? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, you know, in avenues, I mean, the other thing is when you pass over people, I mean, the, you know, it's really interesting. You have, so you have Alexander the fourth, you know, who's a, who's sort of a problem, but, but he's succeeded by, by Urban the fourth. And this is what you know, you're, you're, you're coming about, about, about competing elites. Yeah. Okay. And what happens? Okay. So you have these series of popes in this period of time, you know, like they're all from Italian noble families. Okay. I love Urban the fourth. He's from Troyes. It's, you know, you know how huge in the history of popes and not. So he's French. He's a kind of a cobbler who goes to Paris and becomes a successful master. Right? I mean, so you know, there was there was a path, there was an open, there was an open avenue there that we see, you know, that we see in the 12th and 13th century. Um, and 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 this is the idea of making making the schools, making the schools available. Um, and you know, you have this very interesting history of of of, of, of Urban's fourth of just how does this come about, right? So you have your comment last time about competing elite. And the competing elites of the of, of the in the 12th century, you have the monks in the you know in the schools. And then in the 13th century, you have the you have the regulars in the secular masters in Paris who come together. But you know, there, there are these periods of conflict. Then you have the competing faculties. And so there's that whole history as well, which is fascinating. If I could add one more yeah. that. I, I enjoyed your comments about Hastings Rashdall. Uh, I, I I thought I would point out, though, um, Roger Rebell, when he founded UCSD, read all three volumes of the Hastings Rashdall book, and that, in some sense, went into his thinking about how the university needs to be structured. The, uh, for example, the college of the Well, I, I, so I'll, I'll get it. You know, there, 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 are many, there are many ironies in my life, as I said, the article I wrote about, which I want to see what the, and it was sort of said on the bottom of it, you know, that, uh, I see a lot of students at the law school, but but, but, not, but not, and not not a funny one. But reading these is, is that so I think I think I think it was the, the 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 year after the year after I was denied tenure and made my way to law school was the hundredth anniversary of, of Stanford University, and the then president of Stanford University came to the law professor and called Casper uh, cites cites basically mentions my book. It, 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 <laughs> it's quite good. I could read one more. In connection with 100 days. Yeah, in connection with 100 days versus here. Yeah. So do, right. do you think that they're taking their cues from the other guilds? Or no, so what I but what I want to say is, and again, I, I think I, I think this point was Mr. Lynn, you and I talked about this, and maybe I just run, is if you sort of look at these statutes, okay. What again, this is the, what brings the masters together? Right. 
they talk about how their studies and, their, and their, what they wear is that it's their teaching. It's the teaching mission of the university that binds the university together. And that's what I argue in my book. Is, you know, Hutchins said what the modern university is a bunch of uh, a bunch of individuals drawn together by common purpose of heart. And yeah. that's what Hutchins said. Because, okay. <laughs> and I really do think I think there I think there are two issues striking at the modern, you know, basically the modern university or the modern research university. Is that basically the faculty are drawn outwards, okay, because advancement and promotion depends much more on scholarship and teaching, and the people who evaluate that are external. Okay, and to a great extent, we're doing we see this at law school all the time. Well, no, we don't the internal evaluation, the external evaluations that matter. Okay. And so basically that doesn't bind people together. That that drives that drives them away. Uh, and then secondly, the other thing we're seeing, and you and I have talked about this is okay so these masters take their teaching seriously and so you know they, they're setting the curriculum the standards the timing and all those things of things that they're doing okay so the people setting the rules are the teachers we now have a situation which basically the people who set the rules are not the teachers because most of the teaching is done by adjuncts in many, in many universities and so and so these things so this is what the things that, that have bound and held the university together okay are being are being and the other thing is is we're seeing this is this I, I have this idea of writing this book called University Past, Present, and Future. Okay, we have all kinds of things that are not called university that have really no rights of self governance. I mean, you look at the policy that basically China announced on no academic freedom, or you look at basically a lot of these universities that are established in place like Abu Dhabi, there are all kinds of you know, so basically they're inconsistent with these principles upon which the university was formed. You know, they're, they're higher educational institutions completely serving the interests of. The state and Congress on the other country. They don't have the independence of self governance that was sort of recognized in the religious way. So, those are some of the things that, that we can sort of talk. So, I think that I, 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 you know, I argue that, that, that we now use the university around the world in, in a way that the, the term has lost its meaning. Okay, there are all kinds of things that are called universities. They're really not, they're really, they're really not universities. Another thing that I have talked about, okay, um, and this is sort of another angle. And I gave this talk a few years ago. I believe that, that speaking of a Catholic university should be redundant. The, the, the university is embodied in a tradition which is fundamentally, we call it Catholic, but we can call it Christian. Okay. And, and I think it's, I think it's sort of three basic principles that I talk about this in my book in Carney University. One is uh, the value of all knowledge, because all knowledge comes from one place. You talked about it last year. This issue is limited amount of knowledge, and then, but the idea is. There's limited amount of knowledge. It's understanding as well as expanding because revelation is always happening. But all, not, all knowledge comes from the same place. There's no inconsistency between faith and reason. Mm -hmm. We can't reconcile it all because we don't, we don't fully understand. But if we work really hard and we stay within these bounds, and we're really, we will come to a common understanding. That, and Thomas is a great example of that. And that's, that's, a, you know, that's that really developed in the 12th and 13th century. Secondly, this concept I refer to a little bit is that knowledge is something that should be freely shared. That it should be made available broadly. And said the monastic view, which is keep it behind the walls of the monastery. And to some extent, I mean, very nice. I mean, that's that's where that's where most of Islam, I mean, if you really look at the great schools of the Middle Ages, that's sort of to, to some extent what, what happened. They, they sort of closed up. And I'd like to hear more about it. Um, and the third thing is, and the third principle is, is that basically education is to improve human life and society, to teach people to live better. Okay, and, and 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 again, that's that's a change of view, right? I mean, ceremonies and status is is you know, remember the monastic view, you know, few men will be saved, and most of them will be monks, right? You know, it's the, that was the tradition. Is that everybody can be saved if they live according to their status? The monies that status. You can you can live, and, and our job as the you know, is to teach you how to live better lives. Okay, and that's also the purpose of it. So I think those are these these three principles. Upon which are at the heart of the formation of the university, and I think which I think which rather endure, and I think those are fundamentally based in a view of, of Christianity and, and Catholicism that exists in the 12th and 13th century. So I am really annoyed when there are debates about the Catholic university. I'm really especially annoyed by the concept of contemporary Catholic university because <laughs> I think it, it has it has no meaning um, because I think there is this great there's this great tradition of this institution which has endured. Okay, it really comes out of this tradition. Okay. And 
I think it's I think it's really it's a really valuable institution to save it to protect. Mm -hmm. right? And I think there are challenges too. So I mean, you just mentioned that to make um, education truly affordable. Right. Um, I wonder if you also have addressed this issue of the expense of education. So it happens to be a university quality university here in this country. Couldn't agree more. And the same university, I was thinking that we have in Europe. No, well, again, I mean, I think you know we're we're not at that point, and I don't think it's not it's not the tradition. Um, you know, and, and again, that's you know, I know that's and I don't think it's ever gonna happen. So I don't I don't play battles that I can't win. Okay. Um, but you know, um I will tell you, you know, again, this is whole lot in all of these things. You do not go the old stuff about you know about these, you know, uh, again, this is this this concept is it's a, it's a lot of attacks on scholars are out there to make more money. I mean, it really is that. I mean, basically, it really should be advanced now. They need to be supported, but you know. To, to sell knowledge is simony, just like selling anything else in the church. You shouldn't be doing that. Okay, so there is that. There is that need. But let's take it to temporary. You know, my view, the things that I fought against. Okay, I believe that all scholarships should be based on need. Academic scholarships given to students should be based on need. Okay, and it annoys the hell out of me. Okay, that basically in law schools, for example, we now give scholarships based on LSATs, uh, and then even here at USD. So supposedly, okay, a lot of our scholarship money goes to students who don't need it. Okay, and I'm a great believer that everybody ought to follow the model of the very elite university, the Ivy League universities, you know, in the elite law schools, which is basically to continue to grant all scholarships based on, you know, and I, my wife and I both went to college with scholarships, and I supported my children through college and law school with no scholarships. I will accept that, okay, because we don't need it, but there are students who do. And I think it's a shame. When, when schools that argue that they have this mission and all that kind of stuff basically buy students for rankings rather than support students who need money. So, you know, but when we only have a system like the one in Europe, I mean, look at the resistance even to making community college. Um, you know, it's just it's just a, it's just a different tradition. But the great news is that you know a lot of these schools have built up large endowments. That basically they can if they if they allocate the money they can support the students with that um and, and you know i mean so that's the other thing that i i strongly believe in, you know there's this whole discussion now going on about reparations of particular african americans um my view is the way you the way you do reparations for african americans is to endow historical black colleges and universities at the level of harvard and mit that's what i do I, I think you know as much as possible. We need to make sure that, that the people who want to advance in this plan have access to higher education, and that's become one of the things. If you look at the cost, I'll pay a hundred thousand dollars to get this done. Because I can afford it, you know, because I have great education. Bad news is that a lot of other people can't afford it. They come up with this amount of debt, and there's a problem with that because it means that people then can't afford the things that we look at in our society. Do you, do you feel that? Um, in terms of the, the amount of debt that some of these teams accumulate for college education, uh, the mechanisms behind that debt, the delivery of the debt, I mean, is there, I mean, there's people that make money off the debt. Mm -hmm. uh, so is, is that related to- And universities have been able to just, because of all that available money, they have to jack up their fees because they don't bear the cost. It has to be available yeah. money. From and again, I, I don't think universities have been good stewards. Um, I don't, and it's, it's really one of my criticisms. I mean, frankly, look at the way administration done. I mean, again, I, I, I'm very critical of what American higher education is doing now. There is, was an article written by a USC professor, was that you a few years ago, about the ratio uh, that certain colleges have between the endowments that they have and the scholarships that they have. I didn't write it, but I'm, you know. Yeah. No, but if you really know, I mean, it's sort of interesting, right? I mean, look, so one of the things I'm, 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 I'm happy here, you know, interestingly, Oxford and Cambridge have much more socioeconomic diversity than any American higher education school. So, for example, take the school I got my doctorate from, Brits. They're very, very proud of saying we will give full financial aid to anybody who needs it. Anybody who needs it. About 62% of their students get financial aid. That means that 38% of their students take it from the top 1% of the population. You can't do better than that. Because you're not trying to do better than that. Whereas Oxford and Cambridge have made that effort under the force of a, a, a basic labor governance to do it. 
Okay, and I mean, and that's a shame about. And then you know the thing that I'm right now, you know, that a lot of schools moved to are in the U.S. News and all ranking from the law school. What what happened with U.S. News is that is that scholarships in law schools went from based on need to based on LSATs. It's because of the rate. We do always the rankings that'll go away because there's no reason for me to buy LSATs. So what I want to do is, is basically support the best students I can. But you know, people hold on to that. Um, so I, again, I think there's this collusion that's going on between the parties that we talk about because it sort of works well. And, and I, I think, I think, I, you know, if we look at the growing disparity of wealth and poverty and the, the lack of social mobility that we're seeing in our society, I, I think it's, I think we can remedy that. But uh, I don't think it's going to happen. So where do you see USC in the trend in terms of the two years? I just retired from USC after teaching in the first two years. And uh, I really wonder about the whole sustainability and all of that. Well, you know, you know I, I came here, I looked at certain things and said, wait, why are we doing this? Why are we doing, you know, I had decency to go here. And, you know, we bought beautiful houses. Uh, you know, the family bought beautiful houses on my town where it's locked, you know, where there's all the students who are getting scholarships. Um, you know, and again, not, not very different from my financial position, sending my kids to elite little art schools, these schools are paying full freight, which I was glad to do. I think that's, I, I don't see the just, I don't see the justification. I asked the question when I came here, why, why this place, I think it just, what is it called, the Hispanic Serving Institution, I think it was just adopted. Why didn't that happen 10 years ago? Okay, so I, you know, again, I, you know, I, I don't, Feel that a lot of universities, including this one, are really living up to the mission. I don't know what happens, okay, when you, if, if one of these students comes to a crisis in his or her life, what they or when they need to change careers, what the hell they're going to do? Because you know, if you look at my, I've had a series of those things in my life like when I was, you know, fired as a professor, you know, and what kept me was basically I could read great literature and appreciate great art and great music because I could talk that. Okay, and those got me through, you know, hard times. And then I could adapt, you know, and go from being a medieval historian reading Latin to be someone basing into a very complicated biotech deal. Fair, really good sound education. I'm not sure we're giving people that. We're preparing for their first job. Everything about supply chain management, really good. Okay, well, that's like a trade. I think when you come out, it basically, you know, this is the whole idea, I mean, it, you know, you don't want to fight this view. The, the, the universities were established to help people advance their careers. Okay. As well as to expand knowledge. And, and, and so to do that, you need to recreate professors and masters, but you also needed the students with the right. Um, and, and, and I think so. I think that's at the right hall, right? But and, and one of the things I argue is it's not if, if it were narrow professionalism, okay, then how would the four faculties have come? But it has something in common with things teaching people to live their whole life. Okay, and we're getting to this point. I think we've lost, I think we've lost, we've lost that. But much more like how I was saying, a bunch of individuals, you know, held together by common events like parking, we all know that, you know, parking chips were done two years ago. Fortunately, I was still on the first time. Anyway, it's fine. Well, yeah, anybody who wants to stay and keep talking, please stay. We should probably officially. No, thank you. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. This, um, and read the statutes and tell me what yeah. to think. They're really, they're, they're really odd, right? I mean,